Hey, everyone. Good afternoon. It's a beautiful afternoon here in New York City. I hope it is where you are as well. I'm Susan Coffin. I'm here for Attitude Magazine's weekly ADHD Experts Live webinar. Thank you for so much for joining us today. Um, for our expert talk with Dr. Daniel Ansari, who is here to share some uh, thoughts on helping us to help us understand dyscalculia. Um, although it's literally almost as common as dyslexia, r roughly 7% of students have dyscalculia, this learning disability is neither well known nor really understood. It's a lifelong condition that makes math related tasks arduous and painful. Students with dyscalculia struggle with all kinds of math concepts and tasks. They may not understand concepts like biggest versus smallest. They may not understand that the number numeral five is the same as the word five. So um, Dr. Ansari today will be telling us what are the common signs of dyscalculia are, how can you help a child who is struggling with math problems, and what kinds of supports and strategies are here to help students with dyscalculia. Um, we're thrilled to have Dr. Ansari with us. He's a, a rare expert in this field. He's a professor at the Department of Psychology and the Brain and Mind Institute at the University of Western Ontario in London, Ontario, where he has the Numerical Cognition Laboratory, numericalcognition.org. He received his PhD from University College London in 2003 and has served recently as the president of the International Mind, Brain, and Education Society. Um, he received a number of early career awards from the Society of Research and Child Development from the American Psychological Association, as well as the Government of Ontario. So we are very honored to have you here today. Dr. Ansari, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we would like to start out with a poll to ask those of you who are listening in what brought you to this webinar and what your biggest concerns about raising your child are. Let's put that poll up now, and while you're answering it, let me just tell you a few things about our new webinar platform. It may not be new to you, but it's new to some of us. Um, all the widgets are resizable and removable, so feel free to move them around and get the most out of your desktop space. You can expand the slide area. You can maximize it by clicking on the arrows at the top right corner. Submit your questions to the Q&A widget that's visible on your screen. Um, after Dr. Ansari presents his slideshow, we will be taking your questions and he'll be answering some, as many as we can in the time available. And probably most importantly, this webinar is streamed through your computer, through the internet, and there's no dial-in number. So webinars are really bandwidth intensive. So we advise you to close any programs or browser sessions that might be running in the background. If your network is slow, the slides might lag, and, and that's a question of bandwidth. So with that introduction, Submit your answers and let's see the responses. Um, okay, interesting. Oh, wow. So 21% inability to tell time and then 60% understanding quantities. That's fascinating. Um, and then difficulty counting and understanding concepts like biggest or smallest. Okay. So Dr. Ansari, let me turn it over to you with that background information on our listeners and I'll let you present your slides and then we'll take some questions at the end. Thank you again for being here. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody from uh, London, Ontario, Canada. Uh, my name is Daniel Ansari and uh, my team and I study uh, what we call numerical cognition or how children learn about basic number concepts in math. And today I'm here to tell you about uh, developmental dyscalculia. So I'd like to start out with asking the basic question, what is developmental dyscalculia? I think um, we all uh, have heard a lot about developmental dyslexia, a specific uh, learning disorder in the domain of reading and literacy, but we know less about developmental dyscalculia. So I'd like to start out by just looking at what we know about the currently uh, most accepted diagnostic criteria and those arguably come from the uh, DSM-5, from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders published by the American Psychiatric, Dis uh, uh, Psychiatric Association. And in the DSM-5, um, dyscalculia falls under an umbrella term that's called specific learning disorder. In the DSM-4, the previous iteration of this classification scheme there was a specific uh, category for uh, mathematics disorder, but now dyscalculia 
uh, or math learning disorder falls underneath uh, this umbrella term specific learning disorder. And the DSM-5 defines specific learning disorder as a neurodevelopmental disorder of biological origin. So there's something uh, that's, uh, that's uh, not working uh, quite correctly in the brain brain that is manifested in learning difficulty and problems in acquiring academic skills markedly below age level and manifested in the early school years lasting for at least six months, not attributed to intellectual disabilities, developmental disorders or neurological or motor disorders. So the, uh, the definition really is about something that is quite specific, though it may overlap with other specific learning disorders. Um, and something that's quite persistent. And I think that's very important, this notion that uh, when we uh, try to determine whether a child has developmental dyscalculia, we need to pay attention to their development. We need to understand whether they have just a transient difficulty, maybe they're not paying attention in class, or their teacher is not particularly good. Uh, in developmental dyscalculia, those factors need to be excluded. It's really something where a child presents with a persistent difficulty in acquiring basic mathematical uh, concepts. And in the DSM-5, you have to specify then as when you make the determination that a child has a specific learning disorder, you have to specify whether it's with an impairment in reading, with an impairment in written expression or dysgraphia, or whether it's with an impairment in mathematics, dyscalculia. And under mathematics, uh, things such as number sense, fact and calculation, which I'll go into much more detail, and mathematical reasoning difficulties are listed as some of the things that you might use in order to determine whether somebody has a specific learning disorder with impairment in mathematics. What's really kind of special about the new specific learning disorder designation is that a child can present with multiple of these impairments. You could have a child with a specific impairment reading, but also with a specific impairment in mathematics. And I'll talk about this overlap of dyscalculia with other disorders towards the end of my talk. So as was already mentioned, dyscalculia is uh, almost as prevalent as dyslexia. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, classification and cutoffs used in diagnoses. Uh, but uh, conservatively, I think we can say that about 5% of the population present with developmental dyscalculia. It is important to note that uh, in different literatures, different clinicians, different educators will use, use different terms. So dyscalculia can also be called mathematics learning disorder or MLD or mathematics disorder as it was called in the previous iteration of the DSM, the DSM-4. Now, one thing I already alluded to is that we know a lot more about dyslexia compared to dyscalculia. It is, as Susan said, sort of the forgotten learning disorder. Uh, the ratio of publications back almost over a decade ago now was for every 14 publications of dyslexia, you would find one publication on dyscalculia. And sadly, that state of affairs hasn't changed very much. So there's still a tremendous need for uh, improved knowledge and understanding of the factors that uh, underlie uh, developmental dyscalculia. But we've made some progress. And in my presentation today, I sort of want to reflect to you some of the progress that has been made in the research literature, as well as some of the outstanding questions we have and some of the practical implications that we can already draw now from what we've learned. So when we then ask the question, what underlies developmental dyscalculia? Well, if we go back to some of the early models in the literature regarding the symptoms and causes of developmental dyscalculia, uh, we come across something like this um, graphic here from a, a very influential <clears throat> review article by David Geary from the University of Missouri. David Geary was really um, I would say the first researcher that really systematically started to examine the causes and symptoms of developmental dyscalculia and was sort of uh, somebody who really pioneered research in this field. And his work in the early 90s was very much focused on things such as their counting knowledge, um, their working memory. So working memory, for those of you who don't know, is uh, sort of your limited capacity storage of information that you have while you're executing a task. So for example, if you are in your kitchen and you're cooking, your working memory will be used to store the next steps that you have to follow in the recipe. Uh, 
And in math, of course, you can imagine if you're doing a long division or you're doing a multiplication with, uh, with multi-digit, you need working memory in order to hold intermediate solutions in mind. So one of the things that David Geary's work showed very consistently is that children who are experience math difficulty really have a lot of working memory problems. And those working memory problems, of course, um, compromise their ability to carry out uh, calculation procedures, to hold intermediate solutions in mind, and so forth, to carry and to borrow. And that in turn then affects their ability to encode um, uh, arithmetic facts into long-term memory. And that's really one of the biggest uh, sort of hallmarks of developmental dyscalculia is that when you give a child with developmental dyscalculia a standardized test of arithmetic, you will find that they're very slow. Uh, they need a lot of effort. They probably will use their fingers. They will use all sorts of strategies. When their peers at a similar age and educational level will already be withdrawing those facts from memory. So if you ask them what's two plus four, they immediately say it's six without having to use a, a counting strategy. A child with developmental dyscalculia, long after their peers have transitioned from using counting to arrive at the solution, uh, to retrieve it from memory, those children with developmental dyscalculia will still be persisting with those counting strategies. So in David Geary's work, what he came up with was sort of a, um, a, a summary of the, the sort of cognitive deficits in elementary mathematics of functional deficits, things such as use of immature counting procedures to solve simple arithmetic problems. So one of the ways you can think about an immature counting strategy is, um, let's say I'm trying to solve uh, two plus three. What I could do is go one, two, uh, one, two, three, and then go one, two, three, four, five. That would be a very long strategy, right? A very, and that's what children do very early on. They enumerate both add-ins and then count them together. But what you can, of course, also do, which is a slightly more mature strategy, is to hold up three and then simply add two. So children with dys uh, dyscalculia struggle in sort of making that progression from less mature to more mature counting strategy. And that comes around, it comes, the consequence of that, according to Geary, then, is that you have immature conceptual understanding of counting, they make a lot of errors, and again, they have this inability to retrieve arithmetic facts from memory. Another way of thinking about this is to look at this uh, uh, sort of graph here, where you kind of see the, um, the sort of progression from left to right, from more counting-based to more memory-based uh, strategies when it comes to arithmetic. And it is thought, and Geary documented that in his work, that uh, children with dyscalculia uh, spend a lot more time on these immature count-based strategies and really don't make that transition into memory-based strategies. And that has to do with their inability to encode those uh, arithmetic facts into uh, long-term memory and then to be able to retrieve them. So really, I think perhaps the biggest conclusion from Geary's work was that it is a persistent inability to retrieve arithmetic facts from memory, which is a hallmark of developmental dyscalculia. And interestingly, of course, developmental dyscalculia means a developmental disorder of calculation abilities. And I think that's very important to consider because children with developmental dyscalculia may not struggle in all domains of math. It may be the calculation aspect of math that are most difficult to them later on if they take statistics in, in, in university, they may be doing just fine. And that, that's, I think, a really important thing to bear in mind when it comes to math learning disorders is that they can affect different aspects of math differentially. Here we're really talking about a calculation disorder. So one of the things that happened sort of in the uh, uh, in the subsequent years after David Geary had very much focused on, uh, let's say, characterizing the difficulties that children experience in the early elementary classroom, very much focusing on arithmetic. Other researchers then started to ask questions. Well, what about uh, factors that are more specific to number processing? Because working memory, of course, doesn't just affect math learning, it affects uh, the development of all sorts of academic skills. It's, uh, it's uh, what people refer to as a domain <clears throat> general skill, so it doesn't, isn't restricted to math learning. And people wanted to understand more about domain-specific symptoms of, and causes of dyscalculia. So are there some 
aspects uh, that are very specific to learning about math that might be impaired in these children? And might we be able to identify those kinds of deficits before children enter the formal classroom? And really the analogy here is that is, I think, useful is thinking about phonological awareness and the role that phonological awareness plays in the development of reading. It is very well established that even children before they're exposed to print vary in their awareness that language decomposes into units of sound. So, for example, in a rhyming task, what rhymes with what, being able to identify that is a, a way of measuring phonological awareness. And we also know that those children that have relatively poor phonological awareness early on struggle to learn how to read. They um, then struggle to decode, to learn letter speech sound association, grapheme phoneme associations as they're known, <clears throat> and they lack, lack these foundational skills. So in many ways, researchers after Geary really try to identify the phonological awareness equivalent or the phonological awareness equivalents in the domain of math to really get at this, these core readiness skills that have been identified in the domain of reading. And we're trying to now identify similar core readiness skills in the domain of math. And the, the aim here really was to find something that's very specific to math learning, something that can be identified early on so that we can potentially screen for children that might be at risk of developing developmental dyscalculia before their problems become apparent in the classroom. And we may be then able to assist them early on. And of course, again, from uh, the study of reading disorders and individual differences in reading, we know that children who lack foundational skills, who, for example, have poor decoding skills early on, those skills, uh, those children will continue to lag behind their peers who have those really strong foundational skills, who have good decoding skills, or good phonological awareness. And this has been referred to as the Matthew effect in reading, essentially that those rich in foundational skills continue to get richer, their reading development continues to uh, be on an upward trajectory, whilst those who lag behind early on, they will continue to have this kind of shallow developmental trajectory and can't catch up because it's a bit like trying to build a house on poor foundations. You're going to discover cracks, you're going to have to start again. So this uh, figure, I think, really illustrates the importance of looking at these foundational skills and identifying them in the domain of math in order to get at what might be driving individual differences early on. And the implication really of, of the Matthew effect is that early deficits in core competencies lead to subse subsequent difficulties in acquiring high level skills. And again, here, it's so important to think about developmentally and to ask, well, if a child is struggling with a particular task, what might be underlying that? Rather than just analyzing their difficulties with struggling with that specific task, is taking that task apart, asking about the core components that drive performance in that task, and then seeing whether children have deficits in those core components. So what perhaps the first um, research paper, uh, which has since been extremely influential, that really focused on these more basic core building blocks of number processing, was a paper that was published in 2004 in the journal Cognition called Developmental Dyscalculia and Basic Numerical Capacities, a study of eight to nine-year-old students by Landel, Bevan, and Butterworth from University College London. And uh, I want to show you the results of this paper because I think it illustrates what might lie at the core of developmental dyscalculia uh, in a very clear way. So what Landel, Bevan, and Butterworth did was they recruited four groups of children a group with dyscalculia, so these children uh, performed poorly on the standardized tests of arithmetic achievement, but they did fine on a test of reading achievement or vocabulary of non-verbal IQ. So they really had this specific math difficulty. Then there were children with dyslexia, and those, of course, performed poorly on the standardized test of reading, but did fine on the standardized of math, of vocabulary, nonverbal, and verbal intelligence. And then a third group had both dyslexia and dyscalculia. They were also called the comorbid group, in which you have a comorbidity or co-occurrence of developmental dyscalculia and developmental dyslexia. And then finally, a control group who performed fine on all of the standardized. 
And what they did is they gave them a variety of tests. I just want to illustrate one of these tasks to you that I think very nicely captures and allows you to assess sort of core deficits. So this is a, uh, a so-called number comparison task. So you have to uh, uh, either judge which number is numerically larger or which number is physically larger. So the nice thing is with this task, you can test whether children have difficulties just perceiving number, because if they have difficulties perceiving number, then they should struggle with both tasks. They should struggle with the physical size comparison task, but also with the number comparison task. But if children only have difficulties with retrieving the magnitude, the quantity associated with the numeral, then the number comparison task should be particularly difficult for them. Because in a number comparison task, what you have to do is you have to look at the one and the nine, and you have to retrieve the underlying quantity, and then you have to compare those underlying quantities to one another. Same with eight and two. And of course, if you're doing the size comparison task, you can completely ignore the quantities that are associated with those Arabic numerals, with those digits, and you can just focus on the physical height of the numeral. And what they found very uh, clearly is that children with developmental dyscalculia and those with comorbid developmental dyscalculia and dyslexia, if you look at the last two bars towards the right-hand side of your screen, you can see the reaction time, so how long it took them to make a decision about either the size of the numbers or the quantity associated with those numbers. You can see that in the blue graphs, uh, the children with dyscalculia and dyscalculia and dyslexia really take a reaction time hit when it comes to comparing those two numbers on the basis of their quantity, so which one is numerically larger. And they do much worse. It takes them much longer to really retrieve those uh, quantities and compare them to one another than is the case for the group of dyslexia and the control group, the children without any learning difficulties. And you can see that for size comparison, all of the groups are really fast. That's a very easy task. And dyscalculic kids do not struggle with that task. So it's really when they have to retrieve the quantity associated with the symbol that they struggle. So that's really the take home message from that result. And I think a very important take home message because it suggests that children, even in a simple single digit number comparison task, when they have math difficulties, one of the things that they really struggle with is being able to uh, associate a symbol with a quantity and then to use that association in a number comparison task. So one of the things that uh, Landel and colleagues concluded is that their findings suggest that Dyscalculia is a deficit to represent and process numerical magnitude in a typical way. And that if we think about this developmentally, we can think about a lack of understanding numerical magnitude or quantity early on leads to difficulties in learning numerical expressions such as calculation problems and maintaining them in memory. If you've got a poor representation of the underlying quantity, that's also going to result in difficulties such as uh, needing more working memory and being unable to retrieve them from memory. And importantly, it's really important to think about this um, uh, uh, developmentally and to take a developmental perspective. So the implication here is that dyscalculia is associated with difficulties in processing the meaning of number, and therefore the risk of dyscalculia can be screened before children learn arithmetic. So just to give you an interim summary, what I've told you so far is that developmental dyscalculia is associated with impairments in domain general competencies, such as working memory, uh, especially visuospatial working memory and the retrieval of arithmetic facts. But recent work, or not so recent work, but work since the work by David Geary shows more domain-specific difficulty, particularly with regards to quantity processing. So in a way, if we think about historical models of developmental dyscalculia, we think about something that's very much focused on working memory, on fact retrieval. But if we think about more modern models of developmental dyscalculia, we think about these underlying factors such as numerosity or quantity representation and manipulation. And we now know, I don't have enough time to go into that today, we know a lot more about the underlying genetics, about the neurobiology of developmental dyscalculia, but that will be a, a topic for a whole different uh, webinar. But we have really uh, improved in our understanding of developmental dyscalculia, and I think critically, we've been able to isolate some of those core factors. And it's very interesting that the majority of you said in the Q&A 
that it's about quantity processing, which really echoes the research literature. That's that's what people are more and more documenting is that uh, 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 an inability to efficiently represent, understand quantity, to map quantity onto symbolic representations of numbers such as number words and symbols seems to be at the core of developmental dyscalculia. It's really important to consider that developmental dyscalculia is not one single cause. There's multiple components of developmental dyscalculia. There are probably different subtypes of developmental dyscalculia. And indeed, we found in a, in a cluster analysis that developmental dyscalculia is a very heterogeneous specific learning disorder. We found that there are at least um, six different clusters uh, of uh, sort of subtypes of dyscalculia. So it's really important then to consider that there's not one developmental dyscalculia, but possibly many. And in the context of this, it's also really important to consider that developmental dyscalculia is often not isolated, but it's often comorbid with things such as dyslexia and ADHD and other types of difficulties. And there's no clear evidence for a common cause now. Most studies point to disorders with separate causes, but nevertheless, there might be some underlying causes that are common to these disorders. The other thing that I'd like to highlight, and this really applies to learning difficulties more generally and it applies to the prevalence, is that really when we're talking about developmental dyscalculia or dyslexia, we're talking about um, quantitative differences, not necessarily qualitative differences, because the way in which we classify children as having a learning disorder, a specific learning disorder, is most typically by using some kind of cutoff score. So we say, for example, if you have a normal distribution on a test of math with a mean of 100, we say one standard deviation, which would be 85 below the mean or lower, the child has developmental dyscalculia. And that's, of course, not then verifying it by some kind of biological test. We're just making a quasi-arbitrary determination that that part of the population might have a math learning difficulty. And this is very nice. This issue is very nicely highlighted in a article on dyslexia, but this applies to dyscalculia by Linda Siegel, who says there are many complex issues to consider in developing an appropriate definition of dyslexia, and you could replace this with dyscalculia. One of the major problems is that there's no specific blood test or brain imaging result that can provide a diagnosis. Fundamentally, the issue is that reading is measured on a continuum, and math is too. There's no cutoff score on a reading or math test that clearly divides individuals into dyslexic and non-dyslexic groups. The distinction between dyslexia and normal reading is somewhat arbitrary, where the cutoff point is drawn, uh, drawn varies from study to study. And I think that's important to acknowledge. It's important to acknowledge that we don't yet have a qualitative definition of dyscalculia yet. And indeed, the DSM reflects that they say that academic skills are distributed along a continuum, so there's no natural cut point that can be used to differentiate individuals with and without specific learning disorders. Thus, any threshold used to specify what constitutes a significantly low academic achievement is to a large extent arbitrary. Uh, I've already said this, so I'm going to jump over this. It's just that, that most diagnostic decisions are quantitative rather than qualitative nature, and there can be a wide variety of uh, uh, um, uh, cutoff points used across studies. I think some practical solutions that I would like to offer from my perspective when thinking about how to help children with developmental dyscalculia, it's really critical to think developmentally. We need to not only look at what they're failing at, but why they're failing and what foundations might be lacking and what building blocks do we need to get back to, to in order to build up their mathematical abilities. A developmental perspective also means that we can detect risk factors earlier. We don't need to wait until children fail at arithmetic. We can test their foundational skills and we can train them in playful ways on foundational skills before they learn arithmetic. And research on basic number processing deficits suggests that the following things are really important. Working on symbolic and non-symbolic mappings, what do I mean by that? I mean that helping children or giving them opportunities to see the correspondence between, say, a set of objects and a number, five apples, the symbol five, the number word five and five apples, developing a fluency with that connection between the symbolic and the non-symbolic representations of number, developing fluency with the use of numerals, really helping children from an early age learn how to compare name, order, digits, 
Working with number lines has been found to be very efficient. Playing simple board games such as slings and ladders helps children understand numerical relationships and making numbers salient in everyday life, engaging in conversations about numbers, pointing out numerical relationships that exist in the world, such as laying the table, how many more forks do you need, for example? or in the, when you go to the grocery store, uh, talking about number and numerical relationships can be very, uh, I think uh, there's research to suggest that that can have a positive effect. Before I close out, I just want to talk a little bit about mathematics anxiety because mathematics anxiety dyscalculia often go hand in hand. They're not necessarily the same, but I think we also need to not only pay attention to the cognitive factors when it comes to learning disorder, but also the emotional factors because mathematics anxiety is a huge problem and it's quite prevalent. So this is data from the OECD PISA study, the Program in International Student Assessment, that really shows that lots of students experience math anxiety. This is from thousands of students across the world who indicate you know, up to 60% saying things like, I often worry that it will be difficult for me in mathematics classes. I worry that I will get poor grades in mathematics. So there's a lot of uh, uh, children with mathematics anxiety. We're only gradually starting to understand what it's about. But students' attitudes and emotions, in my view, need to be taken into account. Math anxiety can affect performance dramatically. It's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. We don't yet fully understand whether poor math competence leads to math anxiety or whether math anxiety leads to poor math performance. The two pathways are possible. Math anxiety and math competence are not correlated at one. There's a correlation, but there seems to be something distinct as well about dyscalculia and math anxiety. One of the important things to bear in mind is that teachers and parents can have a role to play in students' math anxiety. This is quite famous work from the University of Chicago showing essentially that teachers' math anxiety can rub off on student achievement. So what they did is they um, measured teachers' math anxiety, children's beliefs about math, and children's math achievement over the first year of schooling. And uh, what they did is, uh, uh, in order to measure their sort of gender-related attitudes toward math, is they uh, read children a story about a child who was good at reading and a child who was good at math, and then they were just simply asked to draw a picture of the child in the story. And the way they classified this is that, you know, children were more likely to draw a, a figure that looked like a girl when they were talking about somebody that was good at math, and more likely to draw a boy when they were talking about somebody that was uh, good at math. And they found that uh, the degree to which children endorse this kind of gender-related stereotype related to their math performance. So what they found was that the first point at the beginning of the school year, there was actually no relationship between teacher math anxiety and children's beliefs or achievement. But at time point two, there was a relationship between teacher's math anxiety and children's achievement. So in a way, the teacher's math anxiety affected the student's achievement, which is quite dramatic if you think about it. And critically, uh, it happened to be the case that it's really through these gender ability beliefs. So uh, the teacher high in math anxiety and students high in endorsing these gender stereotypes led to a decrement in student uh, math achievement. So math anxiety of teachers can have an influence on student math achievement, and that seems to be mediated through the extent to which teachers perhaps uh, endorse these gender ability beliefs. We also know that math anxiety can be uh, reflected in the brain. I'll just skip over this. I can certainly go back to it in the Q&A, but a very nice study from Stanford University showing that students with math anxiety, when they're doing math problems in a brain imaging scanner, activate brain regions that are associated with fear, with uh, coping with negative emotions, such as the amygdala and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, while students without math anxiety use areas in and around the parietal cortex that are well established to be involved uh, in mathematics achievement. So even when you're not priming students about math anxiety, just giving them problems and put them into a brain imaging scanner, you can sort of see signatures of anxiety uh, reflected in their brain activation patterns. We also know, and I'll just briefly go over this, that parents have can have an effect on children's uh, 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 math achievement through their own math anxiety. This is work by Aaron Maloney and colleagues. And here's just a summary of what they found. What they found is that um, parents' math anxiety really mattered when they did a lot of homework with their children. 
So what this shows is that when parents who are either low or high in math anxiety do very little homework with their children, there's not really an effect on the student's math growth over a year. But those, children, those parents with high math anxiety who do a lot of homework uh, with their children, uh, their children's math scores tended to decline. Of course, now it's important to ask what that means. Does it mean that children with high math anxiety uh, make the math learning experience of during homework more stressful? Those things remain to be examined, but it sort of suggests that uh, parents need to be aware of their attitudes towards math because their attitudes towards math, their own feelings about their own math can affect their students' achievement and their students' learning. So how can the negative effects of math anxiety uh, be alleviated? Well, one very simple way turns out to be simply engaging in an exercise of expressive writing. And Sian Bylock has uh, done some really pioneering work in this, showing that if you give students the opportunity to reflect on their anxieties before they take a high stakes exam, that actually has a positive effect on, uh, on their scores later on. So students who are given the opportunity to sort of externalize their fears, think about their fears, those fears then don't seem to compromise their examination performance as much as students who haven't been given that experience. So it's simple things such as just taking the next 10, 10 minutes to write as openly as possible about your thoughts and feelings regarding the tests and so forth, really sort of expressing on paper how you feel about the upcoming exam. And uh, surprisingly, this has really positive effects. So uh, the students who took a math test, who engaged in this expressive writing experience, didn't show any decline in accuracy. In fact, they improved slightly. Students who weren't given that opportunity, they showed a real decrement in their accuracy in terms of math performance. So expressive writing seems to bolster against the negative effects of math anxiety. And researchers think that this has to do with the fact that if you have strong anxiety before going into a test, you've got to bring that anxiety into the test and it's going to consume your processing resources, going to consume your working memory resources, and that's going to compromise your performance. Before I close, I just want to say that I've only had a limited amount of time to talk to you today. Math is certainly very multi-competential. There's things we haven't talked as much about that also play a role in dyscalculia, spatial cognition, working memory. I did allude to briefly, but there's lots more to talk about. Emotional factors I alluded to again briefly, just to give you uh, some awareness of that and something to think about. Phonological awareness also plays a role in math learning. Executive functions, things such as the behavioral control, working memory, of course, is thought to be a part of executive function. Language plays a role as well in math learning basic number processing, which I spent a lot of time talking about, and of course, teachers. And all of these factors interact with one another in complex way. And importantly, they do so over developmental time. So we always need to ask our question, what level is the student at? Uh, what are they learning right now? And what might be the underlying factors that lead to their difficulties? And with that, I'd like to thank you very much uh, for your attention and hope to have left uh, enough time for us to to have some uh, some discussion and, and address some of your questions thank you very much thank you that that was fascinating um, um so lots of questions here let me see um hmm. here's an interesting one from uh, laura she says she says my 12 year old can learn basic math one day appear to have mastered it and then forget what she's learned the next day is it is repetition and more drills the way to overcome this? <laughs> I'm guessing she's thinking maybe not. Um, well, I mean, I think I think when you when you're learning arithmetic, it's always important to um, to find a really good balance between just sort of rote learning, which I think there is there is a place for that. You know, rehearsal and 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 some kind of um, uh, you know repeating. Uh, uh, the solution to facts to really consolidate those long-term memories. But that, that only has a point if you also build in conceptual pieces of understanding. If you help children understand, uh, you know, what addition means, what subtraction means, that uh, subtraction and addition mm -hmm. are related to one another. So it's finding a balance between sort of the, 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 um, the conceptual and the procedural pieces. Uh, but I think repetition is important. I think one of the things that is really important to acknowledge is that it shouldn't be masked, it should be spaced. So what I mean by that is that you shouldn't have like half an hour of just, uh, you know, doing math drills, but you should have it interspersed with other types of instruction, with other types of activities. Okay. Um, um, a number of people have asked what 
kinds of intervention programs you've seen that are effective at remediating basic lack of number sense or recall of number facts or in general um, miscalculated problems? So I'm, I'm of the opinion that most programs that work well in the general classroom are also going to work well for children with dyscalculia. It's just that they need more time with them and that sometimes you need uh. to go back. So I think one of the best ways of, of looking at what really works is to go to the What Works Clearinghouse from the U.S. Department of Education and to look at you know, what programs have been shown to be efficacious through evidence-based research. So I don't want to endorse any particular program, uh, mm -hmm. but what I can say is that it's really important to always ask the question, is there good empirical research supporting this program? Because in education, you know, you have a lot of people offering you uh, new solutions to old problems, uh, but sometimes you sometimes those are not necessarily grounded in evidence, right? They sound convincing, but what we really need to know is, has somebody gone out and done a research study to demonstrate that this program really works for students? I think working on quantity, quantitative relations is very important. You know, doing it in a playful way, if you can, especially in the home, to reduce that stress to reduce the chance of math anxiety coming into play. Uh, playing board games has been shown to be very effective. I mean, that's particularly for young children. There's also a couple of free pieces of software. So Stanislas Tehan, a famous uh, researcher in, in Paris, has developed a program called the Number Race. If you put that into Google, you'll come across that. That has been shown to be quite eff efficacious for some types of students. But I don't think we have a one-size-fits-all solutions to interventions yet. I think the okay. important thing is what works and then to apply that in a way that is, slows it down for students who are struggling. Okay. Um, uh, question from someone who just listened to your answer. What, could you repeat the name of the clearinghouse that you mentioned? Yeah, um, the what Works Clearinghouse. What Works Clearinghouse. Interesting. So make sure that um, whatever technique you're thinking of using um, has has some there's some evidence that it actually works. Right. Um, and, uh, is beautiful in that, that it tells you exactly what the studies are and for which grades it's worked well and for what populations. It's what, really okay, that's great. Um, I thought it was we listeners thought it was very interesting that you talked about the ability to assess potential math issues before the problems became apparent. And um, there's some questions about what what sorts of assessments might teachers do to uh, indicate that there were problems ahead in math and in, in the math, basic math um, understanding yeah. for their students. Yeah, so um, we've worked on some screeners, but they're not they're not assessment tools. I think at, at a young age, if you're talking about four, five, six-year-olds, I think it's important. Mm -hmm. you, you, I don't think we can really talk about formal diagnosis, but we can talk about whether students lack certain foundational skills and sort of help them to, to essentially gain them. I've made available a free screener at www.numeracyscreener.org that you can take a look at. It's not a diagnostic test. There is okay. also a very, a very nice uh, screener that is not free of charge by Nancy Jordan at the University of Delaware called the Number Sense Screener, which you could take number a look at. Number Sense out. Screener? Yep. Uh, number Sense Screener. Those are the two things that come to mind for me now. But I, I think um, I think most, most teachers uh, have an awareness of what some of these foundational skills are. It's just about finding some time early when children first start kindergarten or elementary school to really assess what they're coming in with. You know, I've often thought that when children are four years old, we should be addressing whether they understand not only what, how to count, but what counting means to understand the cardinality principle, because that's really the, the first association between a symbol, a number word, and a quantity. And I think that's, that's really important that, that we look at that because children can count very fluently, but they may not understand that counting, the purpose of counting is to enumerate, to determine quantity. So there are some things that one can do and, and, and uh, yeah, take a look at the numeracy screener, the number sense screener. Those are two things that come to mind immediately.
Could you repeat those, please? It's, bit, it's hard to capture those names. Um, so the send screen up by Nancy Jordan and the okay. numerous. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, I just couldn't hear the 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 actual. Um, the the number sent screener by uh, Nancy Jordan. Okay, and number sent screener by Nancy Jordan. All right. And then we have one uh, called the numeracy screener. It's www.numeracyscreener, all one word, dot org. Okay, www.numeracyscreener.org. Great. Um, thank you so much. Questions, questions about diagnosis. Um, a number of listeners are wondering how one goes about diagnosing a child or an adult, for that matter. There are a number of adults listening in who, who feel that this is something that they've struggled with their entire lives and they've never really been diagnosed, and they're wondering about diagnosis for, for not only children but also for adults. So in general, the question of diagnosis, what, do you, what are your thoughts? Uh, the, I mean, really the, the, the most straightforward ways for children is to get referral to an educational psychologist who can do an assessment. Mm -hmm. The honest truth is that the way in which people assess developmental dyscalculia varies a lot, right? There is no one single protocol for how to do that. Even the DSM-5 guidelines are vague at best. Right. So, it, and that's why I put up that slide about qualitative versus quantitative differences. Assessments. Yeah, that's so interesting. Right. Yeah. Assessments are really based on a on a on a on a quantitative way of making that determination. I think there's also other really interesting approaches to to diagnosis, which are less based in standardized tests, but more based in in response to intervention. You know, and and the extent to uh, how how children actually respond to instruction. Um, to what extent they're, they're routinely implemented, I don't know. But uh, right. I think talking to a educational psychologist, in the case of adults, it becomes much more difficult because, you know, many educational institutions for adults don't really have tools to uh, help adults with developmental dyscalculia. So we're still lagging behind there. And that's something that I think we need a lot more advocacy for when it comes to adults being able to raise the awareness that it is possible that as an right. adult you have this specific learning disorder and that you require accommodation, whether it's in your educational context or, mm. or in your workplace. Yes. And I, if your, your, con, your idea, which as soon as you say it seems so self-evident, but isn't, is that learning disabilities are on a, on a spectrum and that there is no precise cutoff. It makes it all the more um, diagnosis, all the more uh, challenging, does it not? <laughs> um, a question here about math manipulatives. What are your thoughts on consistently providing access to math manipulatives during lessons and also during assessment? So those would be, I suppose, the the, the rods that are used to show um, math re size relationships in math. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's a, it's a very, it's a very complex topic. So in general, um, okay. I think research, the research shows that manipulatives are very useful early on um, and that, you know, they help to sort of make children, help children make that uh, bridge between concrete and abstract representations of so concrete mm -hmm. being manipulative, abstract being symbols but that you need what is called a process of concreteness fading so that you gradually remove more and more of those manipulatives so that children uh, uh, can build those abstract representations, right? I think a lot of successful math curriculum, for example, the Singapore, uh, the way that math is taught in Singaporean schools is to sort of have both, have the model and the symbol and to always have them side by side, right? So I think it's very important not to only rely on manipulatives, but to always allow children to make the connection between manipulatives and the symbolic abstract representation and thinking developmentally again to provide opportunities for this concreteness fading. 
so that gradually you get more and more towards an abstract representation. When I think about manip manipulatives, I think it's it's very difficult to give a straightforward answer because it also depends on the nature of those manipulatives. You know, sure. people do a lot of research on you know how should those manipulatives be coloured? How should they be? So there's there's a lot of different types of manipulatives, and I haven't done right. all the research to recommend one. But in general, of course, in order to help children build the concrete to abstract connections, manipulatives are necessary. Okay, so the concrete to abstract, using both the concrete and moving toward the abstract developmentally. Um, your comment about Singapore was fascinating and speaks to a question here, which and from someone who asks, what other countries are doing this better than we are in the U.S. and um, and what lessons can we learn from those countries? I think you just gave us one from Singapore. Are there other examples of uh, countries who that educational systems that are doing well? Um, I mean, the Southeast Asian countries are really, if you look at the international comparison studies, are, are always at the top. So, you, you mm -hmm. know, you talk about China, Singapore, Japan. Um, but the reasons for that are very complex, and they're not just related to the way they teach. I think, uh, and that's been sort of been demonstrated, that if we take tools from those countries and apply them in our U.S. or Canadian context, we don't necessarily get the same results, and that's because there's also a very different culture when it comes to math learning, right? And right. Especially when you get into the secondary grades, you often have expert teachers, right? These are teachers that are that are trained specifically in teaching math, and they uh, receive continual uh, professional development when it comes to teaching math. So mm -hmm. I think there's a there's multi confidential. I, I do think there are things we can adopt. Um, but there's also sort of system-wide and cultural differences that uh, I think are, are, are slightly more difficult to overcome. The other thing that I always think about, um, you know, uh, for example, comparing Singapore to the U.S., Singapore is a tiny country with a population of 4 million people. The United States is a very large country with a very heterogeneous education system. So when we talk about math education in the United States, we're talking about many, many different ways of math education, right, even with the Common Core. Mm -hmm. I think it's very difficult, but I, I do think the Southeast Asian countries are worth looking at. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. I, and and I, a, I, a, focus, I, a focus on expertise in teaching math specifically being valued, which you're right. Um, undeniable, yeah, undeniable, especially, you know, I think, uh, I don't know specifically how it is in the U.S., but definitely in Canada, one of the things that uh, we see is that ele the elementary school uh, teacher candidates uh, do not often do not enjoy teaching math, right? So we're starting out right. with we're starting out with um, uh, teachers that uh, don't necessarily have very high confidence in math. You know, maybe didn't mm -hmm. go into teacher education because they want to avoid math. So we've already got problems there. So there's a lot of angles where we need to try and, and fix uh, fix some of these issues. Right, absolutely. Training teachers across the board. Um, coming back to the evaluation question, a couple of related questions. One person is asking about the Bracken, Bracken basic concept scale, and another person similarly asks, are there specific assessments that parents should ask schools or psychologists to conduct for older children related to spatial cognition or to uh, working memory? I don't know about the first um, about the first tool that Bracken. was mentioned. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I've heard it before, but I haven't done my research into it yet. When it comes to specific tests that parents should recommend, I honestly, honestly don't have good candidates for that because we don't yet have a lot of these. You know, in the, in the domain of literacy and reading, we have a lot of what's called processing measures. So we've got the comprehensive test of mm -hmm. phonological. Processing, for example, we don't yet have a comprehensive test of basic numerical processing. So I think mm -hmm. uh, we're still dealing with some issues there in, in in developing those measures. But I know that some developments are underway. So hopefully, in a few years, we'll have better measures. Right now, the math measures that are used are still very much focused on arithmetic. Then there are these so-called math reasoning subtests that really combine a lot of different competencies. So. Um, I think there's still a long way to go, at least as far as I'm aware. 
Right. Interesting. This speaks to, um, I think what you're saying speaks to a question here. This is from a person who says, we are a high school. We often get students from public schools that are definitely struggling in math. How do we screen them to find out what the source or the reason is behind their math and ability? And I think what you've just said is we don't really have the tools yet to do that, to, to understand why a specific, what the nature of a specific child and math difficulties I, might be. That's exactly right. The work on adult dyscalculia, there's almost none. You know, and I, I, I get this question a lot, and I've been wanting to focus more on older children, but I've still got so many things to study in young children. So it's, it's kind of difficult okay. to answer. I think when it, one thing that I would say about older children uh, and adults is that we there, we really need to also look at this math anxiety piece and sort of talk with them about their, their math education history and where mm -hmm. did things go right and for what reasons. Uh, and I think one can learn a lot from that. You know, was there a particularly negative experience? Or was it that they really didn't get fractions, for example? And then one has something concrete to hold on to. You know, um, if the problem is with, with fractions, there are good ways of going back to, to helping students understand that. If it's more of an emotional problem, then maybe it's talking about, you know, how can we deal with that anxiety? How can we increase your, your confidence in your own mathematical abilities again? Right. So it's fascinating that you say that because there are several people here. Um, here's one person who said, I, offer I often encounter students who are, who are fine with math, um, challenging but not necessarily impaired, but they, once they encounter a specific type of math, let's say geometry, they struggle incredibly. And someone else says, my child was fine until long division. So there seems to be not infrequently a specific point at which suddenly things become problematic on the math front. Is that about the nature, or, or that that's informational, I think is what you're saying, as to what actually is going on, whether it's uh, anxiety or spatial or some other cause? Yeah, that's, that's again where we have to acknowledge that there can be multiple ways, well, multiple, multiple reasons right. to fail right. a particular point. I think it's there it is. Interesting. Yeah, so mu multiple causes of math problems, and um, so, yeah, interesting. Um, let's see, interesting question here. Do you think that many math contexts are introduced too early? I'm, I'm going to guess you're going to say no to that one, but I'm not sure. Maybe too general a question. Yeah, that I would say it depends on what math concepts you're talking about. Right. I don't know. How right. are they introduced? How are different things connected to one another? I think that mm -hmm. is such an important thing in math is to to build the connections between the different concepts. You know, if we're if we're talking, for example, whole numbers and fractions, to build the connections to, for example, help children understand that fractions are quantities, uh, right? That they're mm -hmm. not different from whole numbers in that way. I think those things are important, but I, I don't know about introducing too early. I think, yes, for example, you could introduce, you know, uh, addition before children have an understanding of how symbols relate to quantities. That will be too early. It really depends in the way in which you scaffold things. And that's why I highlighted throughout my presentation multiple times the importance of thinking developmentally and, and looking right. at what builds on what, and how are things connected along the learning trajectory? Um, that makes enormous sense. We're, we're, we're short of time, and I wondered just as a last question, if you would, um, you mentioned something really in passing because your, your presentation was so rich about the kinds of activities parents might do to help their children have comfort with math facts. I think you talked about the grocery store or setting the table. Are there other examples of of a techniques that you've seen parents use uh, well with children to, to to help them at an early age become comfortable with math? I think you know just having having in mind that you want your children to talk about quantity and quantitative relations helps tremendously. Quantity. And then you then you start to pick out in the world, you know, how many houses do you see, you know, counting things, 
which one do you think is larger? Uh, uh, you know, how many more do you need in order to to get to this next quantity that you want? Playing board games can be extremely rich. You know, um, I think having those math conversations from an early age. Uh, you know, children who read to their parents uh, try to find books in your library that talk about numbers because that's a very nice, playful, indirect way to to introduce number and numerical relations. Uh, I think those are some ways that I that I can think of. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Ansari, and thank you everyone for listening in and asking such terrific questions. I wish we could have asked all of them, but we this subject is extremely rich and you've made it so much easier to understand. So thank you again for being with us today. So listeners, we will make this webinar available um, on our website so you can listen to it again. And, uh, and or download the slides. So look for it later today. And thank you all. See you at the next Attitude ADHD Experts webinar next week. Thanks again. Bye.